So in this video, we're going to use the method of contour integration on the Cauchy distribution, specifically the characteristic function of the Cauchy distribution, which looks like this. It's the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the i t x divided by 1 plus x squared dx. Now, this integral has to be approached differently depending on the value of t. When t equals 0, this obviously becomes 1 divided by 1 plus x squared, which is just arctan. But when t is greater than 0 or is t in less than 0, I'm going to use two different contours in each case. So when t is greater than 0, I'm going to use this contour. And when t is less than 0, I'm going to use this contour. So let's just briefly discuss what each of these contours says. First of all, I'm going to define f of z to be this thing, e to the i t z over 1 plus z squared, just replacing the x's with the z's. And the poles of these functions are going to be, well, I know that 1 plus z squared is the same as z minus i times z plus i, um, or i minus z times i plus z, whichever order you prefer. So I'm going to have some poles at z equals i and z equals minus i, because that's where the denominator vanishes. And I've indicated these on the diagram. They're the red dots at i and minus i, i and minus i. Now, you notice that in each of these cases, uh, only one of the poles lies inside the contour. So what I'm going to do is end up, I'm going to end up using the residue theorem to determine um, the residue of each of these poles and, and therefore the consequent integral of the contour. So my first contour, C1, it consists of a semicircle traversed anti-clockwise. It goes from minus r to r, that's its diameter, and then it curves round from r back to minus r along a curve which I'm going to call gamma 1. As for my second contour, which I'm calling C2, or contour 2, um, it's going to be traversed anti-clockwise as well, but this time I'm going to start from r and go backwards all the way to minus r. So it's in the opposite direction to uh, the diameter of this ray of this semicircle. So it's going to go from r to minus r, and then it's go from it's going to go from minus r to r along this curve, which I'm calling gamma two. And in this case, the pole at i lies inside the contour, but minus i doesn't. And in this case, the pole at minus i lies inside the contour, but the pole at i does not. And I'm going to use those facts to evaluate the bunch of integrals I get differently. So first of all, what happens when t equals zero? So if t equals zero, so g equals zero, my integral basically becomes the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the i times zero, which is one divided by one plus x squared. And that's our familiar integral, which is um, just arctan. And if you want a reminder of how we derive this, just let x equal to tan u. Um, derivative of tan is sex squared, and you end up getting the integral of 1 du, which is u, or arctan x. And then you can evaluate that from minus infinity to infinity. Okay, so what's that? Arctan at x as x goes to infinity is pi over 2. Minus arctan x as x goes to minus infinity, which is negative pi over 2. So that's minus pi over 2 which is just pi. So that takes care of the case t equals zero. Now I want to move on to the case where t is greater than zero. So t greater than zero. What do I do in this case? Well, I want to use my contour C1, and that's going to be a semicircle which lies in the upper half plane, whose diameter goes from minus r to positive r. So that's going to be the integral over the contour C1 of f of z dz. And that's going to be equal to the integral from minus r to r of f of z dz plus the integral of a gamma, capital gamma, of f of z dz. Okay, well, I don't really need to worry about this integral because as r goes to infinity, it's just going to approach my, my original integral of the Cauchy distribution anyway. So let's look at this integral. Um, I'm going to use the residue theorem here. There's a pole inside C1 at z equals i. So I'm going to calculate the residue at z equals i of my function f. So what is that going to give me? Well, there's only one pole here. So I might as well start by multiplying the sum of the residues by 2 pi i. So this integral, integral over C1 of f of z dz, that's just going to be equal to 2 pi i times the sum or in this case it's just one single residue at z equals i of my function f of z and by definition of the residue that's just 2 pi i times the limit as z approaches i of z minus the pole which is z minus i times f of z which is e to the i t z 
divided by z squared plus 1. And now if I factorize z squared plus 1, that's going to enable me to do some cancelling. So that's going to be 2 pi i times the limit as z approaches i of z minus i e to the i t z all divided by z minus i times z plus i and as alluded to earlier I can now cancel out a factor of z minus i like so and that's going to give me 2 pi i times the limit as z approaches i of e to the i t z divided by z plus i Okay, and what can I do now? Well, obviously I can just substitute z equals i because I don't have a, a singularity in the denominator anymore. And so that's going to give me, if I substitute z equals i into this function, I will get 2 pi i times e to the i t i, e to the i t i, all divided by i plus i, which is 2 i. And I've got 2 i in the numerator and 2 i in the denominator, so I can cancel out a 2 and I can cancel out an i like that, and I'm going to get pi e to the i t i. Well, i t i is i squared t, which is minus t, because i squared is minus one. So that's going to give me pi e to the minus t. So that's the value of my integral over c1 evaluated using the residue theorem. So that takes care of this integral on the left. So that one's done. Um, and this one is frankly done as well because I just need to let r go to infinity. So that, that leaves the integral of a big gamma of f of z dz. So what is that going to be equal to? Well, the integral of a big gamma f of z dz taken in absolute values. Um, by the estimation lemma, that's less than or equal to the length of my arc gamma times the maximum value that my function reaches as z varies along this curve. Well, I just have a semicircle, so the circumference of a full circle is 2 pi times the radius, which in this case is r, but I'm going to have to halve that, so that's going to be pi r. Well, what about this maximum value? Well, first I want to look at the, um, the modulus of f and see if I can bound that in some way. So what's the modulus of f? The modulus of f, that's just the modulus of e to the i t z divided by the modulus of z squared plus 1. I'm going to deal with the denominator first. Notice that by the reverse triangle inequality, mod z squared plus 1 is just greater than or equal to mod z squared minus 1. But mod z squared is mod z all squared. So that's mod z all squared minus 1. But on the curve, mod z is just equal to r because I'm tracing out a circle or a semicircle in this case, which has radius r. And that's a positive number. So this is just going to be equal to r squared minus 1. Okay, and when I take reciprocals of both sides, that tells me, therefore, that the modulus of z squared plus 1 is not greater than, but less than or equal to 1 divided by r squared minus 1. So that takes care of the denominator. How about the numerator? Well, you might be tempted to say mod e to the i t z equals 1, but unfortunately z is a complex number in this case. If z were a real number, then I could just immediately say this is equal to 1 and I'd be finished. But unfortunately, I need to do a bit more work. So let's look at e to the i t z in more detail. So I want to look at the modulus of e to the i t z. Well, if I go back to my curve, I notice that basically this curve gamma 1 can be parameterized um, by z equals r e to the i t where t varies from t varies from 0 all the way to pi so if i use this parameterization i replace z with r e to the i t then i might get something more useful so this is the modulus of e to the i t times r e to the i t and that's going to give me e to the i t r but e to the i t is just cos t plus i sine t, so that's cos t plus i sine t in the modulus bracket. And that's going to give me the modulus of e to the i t r cos, let's make that a bit clearer, e to the i t r cos t, um, let's write it out in full, plus i squared t r sine t end modulus. And so what can I do now? Well, I've got e to the x plus y, which is just e to the x times e to the y. So that's the same as the modulus of e to the i t r cos t 
times the modulus of e to the i squared t, r sine t. Okay, and t is a real number, r is a real number, so therefore r cos t is a real number, and t r cos t is a real number, and e to the i x, where x is real, has modulus 1 because it traces out a unit circle in the complex plane. So this is just equal to 1, so I can figure, forget about this term, that term vanishes. What about this term? Well, i squared is minus 1, so this is going to give me 1 times the modulus of e to the minus t r sine t. Well, t r and sine t, those are all positive real numbers, especially taken when t, t is greater than 0, well, they're greater than or equal to 0. Um, so e to the x, no matter what the value of x is, as long as x is a real number, e to the x is always going to be positive. So I don't need to have the absolute value signs. So this is just going to be e to the minus t r sine t. So now I have found um, an upper bound for the maximum value of my function f. So I'm going to plug in all of these values I just found into this, the right hand side of this inequality. So putting that all together, that's going to give me that the modulus of the integral over big gamma of f of z dz. That's less than or equal to pi r, because that was the length, well, let me just leave a gap here, pi r, that was the length of the, uh, the arc gamma, times uh, the maximum value as z varies along uh, gamma of f of z. But that was just less than or equal to pi r times some exponential function e to the minus t r sine t, e to the minus t r sine t, divided by uh, our bound for z squared plus 1, which ended up being r squared minus 1. And I want to take the limit of this whole thing as r goes to infinity, as r goes to infinity. But we need to be very careful here because it might not necessarily go to zero if we're not careful about our reasoning. Well, clearly the denominator is going to go to infinity and r divided by r squared minus 1, that's going to go to zero because the degree of the denominator is greater than the degree of the numerator. Well, what about e to the minus t r sine t? Well, if t is equal to zero, which can't happen because I've already dealt with the, t, the case t equals zero, then I'm going to get pi r over r squared minus one, and that still goes to zero as r goes to infinity. What about if t is not zero? What, at what other points could the um, e to the something be equal to something which is non-zero? Well, if t equals pi, sine of pi is zero, so I'm still going to get e to the power zero, which is one, and that's still going to be pi r over r squared minus 1. So all that I need to make sure of is that I'm going to have e to the minus something. So basically I need to be absolutely sure that t sine t is always going to be a positive number. Well initially I said uh, the following. So I'm taking the case where t is greater than 0. So if I look at the graph of sine t on the interval where t varies from 0 to pi, it looks like this. So that's 0, that's pi, this is the t-axis, and this is sine t. And you notice that sine t on this interval is always greater than or equal to 0. It's never negative. If this were negative, I'd have e to the power of a positive number times r as r goes to infinity. And that's going to blow up to infinity because it, far, it, it reaches infinity far faster than pi r. So for instance, it, it, it wouldn't actually decrease to 0. Um, but now that I know that this is non-negative, I can basically say that this thing goes to zero as r goes to infinity, because I know I'm going to have e to the minus something. So this whole thing goes to zero as r goes to infinity. And so that tells me that the net contribution of the integral of gamma, that's going to go to zero as r goes to infinity. So putting that all together, what do I get? So if I take the limit as r goes to infinity of this thing, I'm going to get that. Um, I'm going to get on here, the integral from minus, to, minus infinity to infinity of e to the i t x divided by one plus x squared dx. That's going to be equal to two pi i times the sum of my residues. 
And let's see if I can find where I wrote that down. Pi e to the minus t. So that's equal to pi e to the minus t for t greater than 0. So that takes care of the case t greater than 0. I now need to do the case where t is less than 0. And that means I need to set up my integrals all over again because I'm now using a different contour. But the techniques I use will largely be the same. So let's do the same integral over this contour now. So let's look at, um, so I'm going to have this time the integral of my contour C2 of f of z dz. That's going to be the integral of what? Well, in the first integral, in the first contour, I went from minus r to r. But in this case, I'm going from r to minus r. So that's going to be the integral from r to minus r of f of z dz plus the integral over gamma 2, because that's the arc that goes from minus r back to r again, of f of z dz. OK, well, just as before, to deal with the integral on the left, I'm going to use the residue theorem again. And if I look inside my contour, there's a simple pole, a pole of multiplicity 1, which happens at minus i. I don't need to worry about the pole at i, because it doesn't lie inside the contour. So I just need to calculate the residue at z equals minus i and then multiply that by 2 pi i. So what do I get? So I get that the integral, contour integral over C2 of my function f of z dz, that is just 2 pi i times the sum of the residues, but there's only one residue, so in this case it's just 2 pi i times the residue at z equals minus i of f of z, and that's just 2 pi i times the limit as the z approaches minus i of z minus the uh, coordinates of the pole, but in this case I've got z minus minus i, which is z plus i, times e to the i to z, all divided by z squared plus 1. And just as before, I'm going to factorize the denominator, and that's going to give me 2 pi i times the limit as z approaches negative i of z plus i, e to the i t z all divided by z minus i times z plus i and I can cancel out a factor of z plus i in the numerator and z plus i in the denominator and that's going to give me 2 pi i times the limit as z approaches minus i of e to the i t z divided by z minus i. Now I can simply substitute z equals minus i into my function inside the limit, and that's going to give me 2 pi i times what? Well, in the, in the numerator, I'm going to have e to the i t times minus i. So let's write that as e to the minus i t i, all divided by minus i minus i. And that's going to give me 2 pi i. In the denominator, I'm going to have negative 2 i. And here I'm going to have e to the minus i t i. Well, I know i squared is minus 1, so minus i squared is just 1. So that's going to give me e to the t. And I know that the 2i's cancel as well. So I can cancel out a 2 here and an i here. And that's going to give me negative pi e to the t, which looks somewhat familiar to my um, integral over c1 when I calculated the residue at that pole. So that takes care of the integral on the left hand side here. So this integral is now done. This integral is effectively done because I'm just going to take the limit. Now I need to do with this integral over gamma 2, which is going to be done in basically the same way using the same type of argument. So I want to look at the absolute value of the integral over gamma 2 of my function f of z dz. And by the estimation lemma, that's going to be less than or equal to the length of gamma 2 times the maximum value of f, the modulus of f, as z varies along this part of the um, contour. Well, as usual, this is just going to be pi r because the length of the semi, the um, arc of the semicircle is half the circumference of a regular circle, which is just pi r in this case. Now we need to look at the maximum value of this thing. Well, this is just going to be so if I look at the modulus of f of z again, if I can scroll down. So the modulus of f of z, that's going to be equal to the modulus of e to the i t z divided by the modulus of z squared plus 1. 
And just as before, I know that the modulus of 1 over z squared plus 1 is less than or equal to 1 divided by r squared minus 1, using the, exactly the same argument as above. Now I just need to look at modulus of e to the itz again. So modulus of e to the itz, what is that going to be equal to? Well, I'm going to be basically be doing exactly the same calculation. I'm going to let z, so basically I'm going to let z be equal to r, r e to the it again and let t um, vary between uh, this time 0 and negative pi. So what happens when I do that? Well, I'm just going to basically get the same thing again. So if I scroll back up to where my calculation was, I should be able to save some time. So I'm basically going to get e to the minus t r sine t, so this thing here. So this thing is going to be equal to e to the minus t r sine t. Now, in this case, this highly depends on my parameterization. And in this case, I wanted t not to be from 0 to pi, but t to be from negative pi to 0. And that's quite important because I'm imposing the condition that t is less than 0 as part of my assumption and that r is greater than 0. So is it the case that when I take the limit as r goes to infinity, that this whole thing is going to go to 0? Well, I need to be very careful here. So let's look at what sine t looks like. So if I draw a quick graph of t versus sine t. Well, I know that from 0 to pi, it's going to look like that. So that's going to be pi, and that's going to be 1. This is going to be 0. Uh, I'm interested when t is less than 0, and specifically on the interval from minus pi to 0. And when that happens, it's going to look like that. And minus pi is here. And the thing that I notice, if I can just draw my pi correctly, the thing that I notice is that sine t is never positive along this interval here. So this is the interval that I'm interested in. And t never goes above the t-axis, uh, sine t never goes above the t-axis. So that puts me in the clear essentially because t is less than zero and sine t is less than zero. So if t is less than zero and sine t is less than zero, um, or rather less than or equal to zero on this interval, then that tells me that t sine t is going to be greater than or equal to 0. And if t sine t is greater than or equal to 0, I've got e to the power of um, minus r times a positive number, which is e to the power of r times a negative number. So that's OK, because that's just going to decay to 0 as r goes to infinity. So that's going to tell me that I've got the integral of gamma 2 of f of z dz that is less than or equal to what? Well, I'm going to have, as usual, pi r divided by r squared minus 1 again. And t, I will have e to the minus t r sine t. And as r goes to infinity, this whole thing will go to 0, and this whole thing will go to 0 as well. So this is going to go to 0 as r goes to infinity. OK, so putting that all together, that tells me that this integral is now taken care of because this goes to zero as r goes to infinity. Okay, and I know that this integral has value minus pi e to the t. So as r goes to infinity, therefore this tells me that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the i t x divided by 1 plus x squared dx is going to be um, was it minus pi e to the t? Let me just check. Yeah, minus pi e to the t. So minus pi e to the t. Ah, but there's a catch. This integral is not from minus infinity to infinity. Remember, it's actually from r to negative r. So if I go back up to my integral up here, it's from, if I can just find it again, it actually goes from r to negative r. So this is an integral from minus infinity to infinity. It's actually an integral from positive infinity to negative infinity. So if I multiply both sides of this equation by minus 1, this tells me, and, and swap the limits of integration, this tells me that minus the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the i t x divided by 1 plus x squared dx, that's equal to minus pi e to the t. And I can cancel out a negative sign from both sides. 
And that tells me that this whole integral is equal to pi e to the t for t less than zero. So now I've got three different answers depending on the value of t. So let me just put all those together into one neat formula. So the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the i t x divided by 1 plus x squared dx, that's equal to what? Well, what did I get when t was greater than 0? When t was greater than 0, I got pi e to the minus t. So this was equal to pi e to the minus t for t greater than 0. It was equal to pi for t equals 0. t equals 0 because that was just the arctan. And when t was less than 0, I got pi e to the t for t less than 0. So one nice way of summarizing all of this information into one simple function is to say that this is equal to pi e to the minus the absolute value of t for real values of t. OK, so that's how we use the method of contour integration to evaluate um, the characteristic function of the Cauchy distribution, or at least a scalar multiple of it. OK, so thanks for watching. If you like this video, please leave a like, comment and subscribe for more content just like this. Thank you.